The period from 1500 to approximately 1520 is known as the High Renaissance. During this brief time, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael overshadowed all other artists. Through their brilliant innovations and dazzling creations, the lofty ideals of Renaissance humanism would be fulfilled. The Renaissance era was characterized by an insatiable desire for knowledge, particularly knowledge of Greek and Roman culture. Now, although loose ties between East and West had been maintained since the Greco-Roman era, the Turkish threat during the 14th century served to tighten the bond between the two. In an effort to obtain Italian support against the Ottomans, the Byzantine Emperor sent Manuel Chrysoloris to Italy as a diplomat in 1397. This Greek scholar eventually settled in Florence, where he began teaching Greek and translating the works of Plato and Homer. Thus, it was Chrysoloris who sparked the desire for classical learning that spread throughout Italy and up into the northern countries as well. The works of Erasmus and Raphael vividly illustrate the geographic span of the movement and its unique connection with the Church. Both endeavored in their work to reconcile Christianity, which they devoutly believed, with classical philosophy, which they had come to admire. Erasmus was an Augustinian monk who, like the founder of his order, sought to reconcile Plato's metaphysical concepts with the doctrines of the Roman Church. Erasmus' admiration of Greek and Roman culture inspired his textual and linguistic study. The fruit of his labors was a wide range of improved, or first edition, translations of classical, patristic, and biblical texts. This unique scholar's linguistic genius, coupled with his creative gift for satire, made him both popular and influential. Through his satires, Erasmus undermined the authority of Rome's ecclesiastical system, while his biblical scholarship and translation work inspired a return to the authority of Scripture, foreshadowing the Reformation in the years ahead. As one anonymous epigram of the era aptly noted, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. Now, one of the most famous pictorial illustrations of this attempt at reconciling classical philosophy with Christianity is Raphael's Stanza della Signatura. The Stanza della Signatura was a series of frescoes commissioned by Julius II to decorate the papal rooms. Now, although commissioned by a Christian pontiff, this artistic panorama is startlingly classical in its syncretism. The fresco in the series that most clearly mirrors the Renaissance era's admiration of secular antiquity is the School of Athens. At the center of the work, Raphael places the two most revered Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. These classical philosophers both look to human rationality as a means of answering life's most important questions. Their differing conclusions, however, produced a continuing conflict between the man of pure reason, embodied in Plato's idealism, and the man of pure science, embodied in Aristotle's materialism. Raphael visualizes this conflict through each figure's gesture. Plato, the idealist, points to the heavens, emphasizing his transcendental philosophy of the mind. Beside him, Aristotle stands, hand outstretched, palm downward, symbolizing his emphasis on the material world. The book each scholar holds serves to further highlight each man's focus. Plato holds his Timaeus, and Aristotle his ethics. The supporting characters Raphael includes are equally important. In the lower left register, we see Pythagoras, Parmenides, and Epicurus. These three, along with Heraclitus, pictured in the foreground writing on a block of stone, represent four of the five pre-Socratic schools of thought which sought to investigate the natural world and man's place in it. In the lower right register, Raphael pictures Ptolemy, Zoroaster, and Euclid, three astronomers who embodied the ancient world's attempt to unravel the riddles of the universe and to explain that which transcends the material. Another fascinating detail is that Raphael creatively merges the past and the present by using his contemporaries as models. For example, 
He models Plato after Leonardo da Vinci. Euclid after the architect Bramante. And the brooding Heraclitus after the enigmatic genius Michelangelo. Raphael also paints himself interacting with Ptolemy and Zoroaster. In so doing, he highlights the changing role of the artist during the era. No longer viewed as mere craftsmen, artists like ancient philosophers were beginning to congregate to discuss and share ideas about the world, about art, and about the interaction of the two. If Raphael's paintings reflect the philosophic concepts and artistic tastes that shaped the time, Leonardo's life and work highlight the technical innovations of the period, innovations that would take Western art to a new level. As the architect biographer Vasari notes, Leonardo was the consummate Renaissance man. In Lives of the Artist, Vasari writes that the most heavenly gifts seem to be showered on certain human beings. Sometimes supernaturally, marvelously, they all congregate in one individual. Beauty, grace, and talent are combined in such bounty that whatever that man undertakes, he outdistances all other men and proves himself to be specially endowed by the hand of God. This was seen and acknowledged by all men in the case of Leonardo da Vinci. Now, it is certainly true that Leonardo's versatility and talent were extraordinary. Ironically, his frenetic imagination also made it difficult for him to finish many of the projects he started. His notebooks, many of which are now in the Royal Library at Windsor, are filled with thousands of detailed drawings and meticulous notes on botany, weaponry, flying machines, and, of course, anatomy. According to Leonardo, a painter, above all, must keep his mind as clear as the surface of a mirror. Now, despite Leonardo's pervasive influence as an artist, his paintings are relatively few. This familiar masterpiece typifies his innovative approach to composition and his fresh presentation of traditional themes. In The Last Supper, da Vinci isolates Christ at the center of the picture. On either side of the Savior are the animated figures of his disciples. The dynamic groupings focus our attention on the contrast between Christ's serenity and the disciples' agitation, enlivening that moment of high drama in which the Son of God on the eve of his crucifixion names his betrayer. Now, historical records confirm that this work took years to complete. According to some sources, the reason for the delay was Leonardo's mercurial work habits. On some days, he would paint from dawn till dusk without a break. At other times, he would be absent most of the day. Then, toward evening, he would burst into the monastery, climb the scaffolding, complete a few brushstrokes, and scamper out again. Then there were days when he would come just to sit before the mural, staring at the work. As may be guessed, the leading monk at the monastery was on more than one occasion livid at such delays. But Leonardo seemed oblivious to his ire. When the last face, that of Judas, was finally completed, the whole brotherhood breathed a sigh of relief. Unlike da Vinci, Michelangelo was obsessively disciplined in his work. Genius is eternal patience, he once wrote. Now, early in his career, the young Michelangelo was befriended by Lorenzo de' Medici. Lorenzo's impressive collection of classical antiquities ignited a passion in the young artist for sculpture. Michelangelo would go on to excel in architecture and painting as well, serving nine popes in the process. Although many consider his series of frescoes for the Sistine Chapel his crowning achievement, he always viewed himself as a sculptor. Although this Pieta was done in Michelangelo's youth, it is a work of mature artistry, ripe in physical beauty and rich in Christian theme. The artist's concentration on what he termed the heart's image created within the work compelling paradoxes. For example, though dead, the distended veins in the Savior's hand yet pulse with life, and Mary, traditionally portrayed disfigured by grief, is here the picture of pensive tranquility. 
Now, when commissioned, Michelangelo promised to carve the finest work in marble which Rome can show. He succeeded. In Michelangelo's statues, the Renaissance ideal reaches perfection. Some have speculated that the artist's obsession with beauty was in part due to his dissatisfaction with his own appearance. He once remarked, I consider myself so ugly, my face inspires fear. Regardless of his motivation for pursuing the ideal, the art he created never fails to inspire awe. Michelangelo wrote to Vasari saying, I have reached the twenty-fourth hour of my day, and no project arises in my brain which hath not the figure of death graven upon it. I am dying, just as I am beginning to learn the alphabet of my profession. Despite this great man's final reflection, those of us who enjoy the legacy of his work can say that he not only mastered the alphabet of art, but through his paintings and sculptures, became one of its greatest poets.